Um, good afternoon. Again, this is Takeshi Ueda, a natural uh, principal natural resource and agriculture economist, uh, Asian Development Bank. And uh, I, want, I, I will be moderator today. And my colleague, uh, Sunai Kim, uh, she's senior natural resource and agriculture specialist. Uh, she will be keynote presenter. So she's connecting from Korea uh, online, and she's giving presentation. Then uh, let me uh, quickly introduce panelists. Um, first, uh, Ms. N uh, Neelam Patel, senior advisor, agriculture and allied sectors of National Institute for Transforming India, NITI uh, Ayog. NITI Ayog is a former planning commission of the government of India. Ms. Patel uh, he has, he has been working, uh, he has more than 25 years experience in agriculture, research, and policy making. And uh, yes, so uh, Dr. Patel is sitting in the middle, yeah? Yep. Uh, next is uh, um, Ms. Stephanie uh, Montgomery, Program Manager, Asia, and International Development, Plant and Food Research. Ms. Montgomery, he has more than 20 years experience in international development, working in agronomy and specializing in co uh, conservation agriculture for uh, bro uh, broader care, rain-fed and irrigated fa farming systems in Australia and Southeast Asia. Yeah. Then uh, Ms. Fulang uh, Dashdava, she is connecting online uh, from Mongolia. She's chairperson. Tavan, uh, Tavan Bogut Group, uh, Mr. Fulang and uh, Ms. Fulang uh, together. Uh, they established Tavan Bogut Group in 1995. The group is a Mongolian conglom uh, conglomerate uh, with 14 subsidiaries and four affiliates in trades and services, manufacturing, financial services, restaurants, tourism, and hospitality businesses in Mongolia. The group owns Gobi Corporation, you may know as Kashmir, Global Kashmir Company, which currently operates about 140 stores in 40 countries. Uh, next is uh, Mr. Uh, Prasun Kumar Das, Secretary General, Asia Pacific Rural and Agriculture Credit Association, uh, APRACA. APRACA supports 92 member financial institutions in 24 countries in the region to build their cap uh, ca capacities in provisioning sustainable financing solutions. His prior assignments include the positions uh, of managing roles in various international development organizations and projects and, fina uh, and financial sector. Uh, Mr. Ari uh, Perez, um, sitting close to me, uh, President and CEO, Clark International Airport Corporation, CIAC. Mr. Perez is tasked with the responsibility of transforming the 2,367 hectare Clark Civil Aviation Complex into the premier global civil aviation logistics hub of Southeast Asia, including full terminal. Uh, with over 20 years of experience in managing national government projects and programs. Um, Mr. Kevin Cheng, Senior Research Fellow and Head for East and Central Asia Office, uh, International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, and uh, Kwisi Chair Professor of the School of Public Affairs at Zhejiang University. Mr. Chen's research focuses on the impact of major stock uh, shocks on China, China's agriculture and the rural areas, agri-food value chain development, public policies on poverty, and modeling of food, environment, and health nexus. Um, okay, so we have great uh, panelists, and now uh, I want to invite uh, Sunny uh, for keynote speaking. Uh, speak, speaking. Uh, Sunny, please. Let me just, um, 
Okay, so I trust that my slides are shown. Okay, so I'll start. Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a really good pleasure to uh, talk to you about the greener agriculture food value chain development, synergizing public and private sector interventions. Uh, today's discussion built upon yesterday's very fruitful exchanges and insights we gathered on the public-private partnership on the food system transformation session, and we laid uh, good groundwork for uh, today's deliberation. Yes, and as the title of this session suggests, we are now discussing the pragmatic... Oops, sorry. Sunny, sorry. Yep, yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's okay. Good. Right. So we are. Okay. Let me see. Uh, Let me just. Uh, Krishna, yeah. Krishna, so, uh, I the title of this uh, session suggests that we are now building on the pragmatic solutions, and in doing so, I will briefly touch upon why we are discussing about the more investment in the value chain development, and where are the status of the private investment. And in doing so, we will also try to uh, show not only ADV's own operation lessons learned, but from our development partners as well, so that we can really identify practical areas for more collaboration. Um, in terms of the value chain development, when I go, when I recall my early days of practice, like almost 20 years ago, when we discuss about the value chains, it was very much on the pro poor approach. Uh, and income generation of smallholder farmers focused for our development partners. And that actually also has a some inevitable trade offs that rather than more uh, landscape based approach and environmental impact, we really focus on the income generation of the uh, farmers. So these days, this discussion has more transferred towards looking at the consumers demand and more uh, policy driven also enabling environment for the supply chains to be more sustainable. So one example is that in the European Union that the uh, CSR did the corporate sustainability reporting directives was announced in January 2023. And that requires large companies as well as SMEs, listed SMEs, to report on their sustainability. So World Economic Forum also concluded that nowadays business without sustainability or sustainability in supply chains is not a business model, it's a necessity. So this drives also value chain development and rather than talking about the one commodity and the fragmented value chain actors, how to improve their actions, we are now moving towards looking at the multiple value chains and then understanding them within the food, trans, uh, food system perspective. So now why we are also talking about the uh, private investment? In the 60s, that the agricultural growth was more intensively uh, related to the use of input and land use. And then we turned into a little bit more positive growth of more productivity-driven growth. Having said that, in the last 10 years, we again see the decline in the productivity-driven growth but rather extension, expansion of the land and more use of agriculture input-driven uh, growth. So USADA reports mentioned that this is not sustainable way of meeting the population-driven growth and the required food, the fiber, uh, feed, and the bioenergy that's uh, required. So this another graph also shows that global productivity is not growing fast enough to meet the projected uh, growth. Um, and as you can see that most notable thing is that in the lower income countries, that it's still very much input driven uh, growth of the agriculture sector. And we need to really transform them into productivity enhancement and better use of natural resources. 
So apparently, as we move towards more productivity-driven value chain, efficient natural resource use-based value chain, landscape-based approach in value chain, and equitable, inclusive, and greener agriculture value chains, of course, we need more investment. But not only that, there is a financing gap because of the added pressure from the climate change, consumer the diet, uh, consumers' dietary change, and use of more innovative solutions for our farmers' adoption, and providing attractive uh, employment opportunities for the rural population, we require more investment. Then what about why we are not getting enough private investment in this greening agriculture value chains? Um, when we look at the investors, they also need return. And of course, in the carbon market, that is more firm and concrete areas where the private sector's investment can be drawn. But the other environmental services and bio biodiversity benefits are not easily capturable by the market. Hence, uh, there is a slow transition and uh, investment uh, from the private sector. The World Bank report also uh, state that the public investment tend to crowd in private investment. And because a lot of the public sector investments are going into the same market, competing with the private sectors, so they tend to also hesitate in entering into uh, the competition, knowing that the dominance of the public investment. And in some countries, ADB and our development partners also observe that sometimes the government use of our sovereign investment as uh, giving assurance to private investors of the not changing the direction, the course of development path is not too often, and kind of assuring them to invest in the same uh, in, uh, project. Uh, and the lack of policies and regulations, uh, which also gives a lack of incentives for the private sector to cover their uh, high, higher transaction cost. But despite these difficulties, we also observe diverse sources of private investment going into the agriculture value chains. Um, farmers' own saving is also a very important area. We want to acknowledge that. Impact investors also making differences in the scene. Blended finance and the commercial banks, the private equity, venture capital, microfinance, and development partners a sovereign investment in grants some, uh, such as ADB's own is also part of this uh, landscape in private investment in the agriculture sector. So with this background, I will go into uh, more potential areas of a, a partnership that we identify. And first of all, uh, market linkages and value addition. Within that, I would like to first start with the wholesale market. Uh, there, the European Bank EBRD had gathered lessons in the early 90s from their investment in the Central and West Asia, uh, in the, yes, in these countries. And it's also ATP's own experience in India. It's not different. And what happened was that although there are a positive also um, impacts from this uh, investment in the wholesale market, that we also observed uh, some lessons, key lessons, which drove EBRD to shift away from financing this wholesale market, but more towards directly private retailers. Um, wholesale market by definition is the physical space where the fresh food can be gathered. And by this concentration, they generate competition and more market transparency. So these wholesale markets are designed to be um, somewhat monopolist because they are concentrated, they're bringing all the market players in, in one, uh, one ground. So they are in a way playing the monopolist and this is why a lot of public investment is going into this whilst in uh, many cases, they also invite the private sector and in some cases, they also transfer the management of uh, the functions to the private uh, companies. So how it happens is that uh, the wholesale markets uh, are 
supposed to cover their operational cost from renting this space to suppliers. And then the customers who come to here pay the entrance fees and they use these funds for uh, not only the operation costs, but sometimes even to repay the loan. But okay, so I'll start with the positive lessons that it creates the competition and transparency. And because of that, consumers can also enjoy more better quality standards and better grading and packaging the uh, foods are traded. And from the overall like urban management perspective, also some governments build the wholesale market so that it decongest the city center, the traffic and less pollution and removal of informal blank markets. Uh, and then removing them and they, they are invited to participate in this wholesale market. But a lot of lessons are also learned that, and I have also visited these uh, uh, markets that are not utilized uh, enough, is because already established markets out there, and then we invite all the marketplace to another new place and pay for the services that they used to just to enjoy freely. This was not happening at the expedited way or the speed that we envisaged in the beginning. And because that uh, it requires the legal framework that now everybody should use these uh, uh, services and removal of the blank market, that really requires the government a strong willingness to implement this legal framework. And without that, it, this uh, success was not being observed. And also because the uh, farmers and the suppliers, they are expected to use this space, their ownership in the governance and management decisions uh, was important. We also want to highlight that it's all about the location because um, it's all about the location, but at the same time, the private investment alone has a very limited chance because we start from the public lands, government owned land, then the selection of the most effective location is already limited from the starting point. This is why in most of the developed countries after 60s, 70s, they are more focusing on the directly supporting the retail market rather than building the um, wholesale market. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't because in large size countries of developing countries, it still has values, but we need to apply these lessons very carefully and um, avoid the adverse impacts. Second part I would like to highlight is the role of traders. It's very interesting that um, these traders are the ones who directly go to the farmers and they collect the food. Uh, sorry, they collect the product and they sell it. But because of it, the right side is one example that we studied from and found out from Uttar Pradesh in India, that it's just an example of gram, but it's quite common in developing countries, all across developing countries. We observe that in this case, 50, 60% of farmers, they sell it through the traders who come to their field. Sometimes it's a uh, 78 per 80% by uh, different crop and sometimes it can be like almost 90%. So what happened is when the traders most of the time they don't uh, provide the different prices based on the quality. They just bulk purchase and then go. So uh, introducing sustainable production is not really giving incentives for farmers because there is a someone come and just buy everything. So in the beginning, the development partners were quite negative about the traders' law and we wanted to replace them by the farmer group associations. But later we realized that farmers are actually in the marginal areas. They appreciate traders that somebody at least come and buy their uh, products it was very appreciated. So we need to approach these traders and build uh, effective partnership more carefully. Okay, I just checked the time, sorry. Um, and the last space that I want to talk about under the market linkages is a very interesting case from Indonesia about the farmer extension services. And this is the uh, project financed by IFAD and the government of Indonesia. 
and about the coconut development and how the farmer extension services has evolved. And interestingly, it started with uh, one uh, quite smaller scale, I would say like a 40 to $50 million loan project uh, with the uh, IFA finance the project provide the food extension services and really try to build the technical uh, capacities of farmers. But as they do that, they had entered into MOU with the Mars. As you know, the Mars is a global uh, distributor, an important player. Um, so they, by uh, having an MOU with the uh, Mars and established the public sector, they uh, established this uh, coconut development center. And Mars was the, pro the one who providing the new technical support to the CDCs and then pre uh, provided this uh, advisory and training for the farmers. So given the time limit, I'll just uh, um, go into the outcome of this project. Through this partnership and because the extension services are directly provided by the supplier, the farmers got the better price premium and they had to even guaranteed the price for quality cocoa when they meet the requirements. And there is also the increased yield. Uh, this is also uh, one of the very promising elements. And uh, with the enhanced quality, they were able to enter into international markets. And another like spillover impact is that there are uh, the master trainers who are also generated and farmer group performance enhancement was very much enhanced through the public investment. And through this project, the female farmers also organized the new cocoa nurseries, which is another element for important uh, sustainability of this uh, business, but also the uh, environmentally uh, sustainable business of the model. Okay, so that's related to market linkages. And now we uh, discuss about the rural finance, that there are very various models uh, and the modality that we can introduce in the rural finance sector. And as you have heard from yesterday, working capital is the most important area and where farmers really uh, have difficulties in getting it. But in this case that the um, CFC is a common fund for commodities, it's an impact investment example. So what the CFC had done is they drew uh, financing from diverse private sectors. And then they provided the trade finance, loans, but also working capital to the farmer groups. Uh, and through the other technical assistance support, they also provided grants to uh, for the training and extension services. So this is also very uh, kind of innovative model of uh, blended financing and way to the opening and thinking about the new modalities in rural finance. Because of the time, I will uh, go to the next slide. Uh, another area that we can think about the public-private finance investment is the R&D areas, where as you can see from this uh, graph that while the private sector's investment in R&D is really increasingly becoming important, uh, still public share is higher. And in the agriculture sector, why we emphasize the R&D from the private investment is breedings or seed quality and the seedlings or agriculture input is largely coming from the private sector. And their um, engagement and their willingness to extend these services to marginalize the smallholder farmers is a critical element. And R&D is also uh, critical for enhancing more farm mechanization and conservation technologies and bringing resilient practices to be more affordable level and more various uh, options for different type of farmer groups that we encounter in uh, different areas of Asia Pacific. Uh, and in doing so, we also have to be very mindful about the speed of this R&D cycle and more investment uh, required to uh, accelerate, given this uh, climate change and uh, related pressure. 
And as in most of ADB operations, we also try to um, enhance the private uh, public sector's role because of this intellectual property right issues where developing countries, sometimes they are reluctant or have um, some barriers to go into knowing that how much they need to catch up and whether they can really compete effectively in the global market. So that part, I think really harmonization of the public and private investment uh, the, that's very critical and important to bring out success. Uh, the another element is the uh, food safety, which is uh, uh, growing very fast and becoming a very important topic for the uh, agriculture investment areas and definitely for the uh, value chains. Um, and as I mentioned that uh, in the beginning, that because of the supply, uh, sorry, the consumers' demand on food safety is driving the legal framework changes. Now the suppliers are also required to meet their expectations. And according to the study by IFC that the benefits of food safety management system improvement is not only about the sales, but also mostly about the risk management, uh, addressing the risk management, that they can have a um, higher workers increasing their loyalty or the better protected brand images in the market and fewer consumer uh, complaints and resilience to internal external risks. So those are important elements that we also have to incorporate into the uh, production side. And current HESAP or the other the stand food safety standards are tend to be more about uh, outside of a primary protection. And to address that, uh, we are also introducing like a, uh, good agriculture practices or production related standards we are also uh, introducing. Uh, another element is, uh, this is also very interesting as we talk about the private investment that, as you know, that these days, the um, private sector is uh, very much required to comply with the environmental and social and governance principles. And those are also kind of elements to ensure the green investment. Um, our, the multilateral development banks have a safeguard requirement. And sometimes we hear the challenges from the private sector that this is very strict and it's very uh, hard to meet and they need to require their business uh, procedures or process a little bit more on, uh, uh, advanced and re requires investment. But that might help these companies to also meet the ESG standards and, and how we can more effectively address their, you know, the market report and their um, uh, responsibilities can be also considered in our MDVs safeguards um, applications. Uh, standardization, I will not go into too much detail because I think private sectors can share um, more insights later through the from the panel discussions. Now to have a little bit more effective discussions about how this knowledge and uh, panelists also views can be interpreted into ADB operations, I'll give you some examples of ADB operation. Um, so for us, this uh, Sovereign and private sector investments harmonization is very important. And uh, it starts from the policy dialogue, what barriers in the private sector is facing and what policies are required for the private sector to invest more. And as we design our sovereign investment, we invest in public goods, but we also think about where the private sector's rules are. And sometimes we actively play the role to convince the a government that uh, the give the room and not to crowd in the private sector investment in the sector, or where are the areas the private sector has better added values and can do more effectively. So the harmonization and balancing is what we also emphasize. So I'll give you three examples. One is in Uzbekistan, where it focuses on the production and marketing of horticulture products. Um, it actually the 
ADB financing 100% was provided to credit line to eight selected uh, uh, participating financial intermediaries, eight banks. And through the banks, the beneficiaries received the fund. And it turned out that most of the cases, they invested in greenhouses, cold storage development, processing, and orchard development. So, um, sorry, I missed, I didn't uh, read this uh, four bullet points I have. Those are the reason why that this project really focused on providing these uh, credit lines to the farmers because the commercial banks are reluctant to extend the loans due to the perceived risk in agriculture businesses. And typically these loans for agriculture sector is quite small and cash flow is highly seasonal. So it makes credit assessment for the banks very difficult. And because the farmer population is dispersed, the operation of local bank branches is also unprofitable. And farmers lack financial literacy management skills to prepare business plans. And as you know that these um, problems are not just for Uzbekistan and in a lot of developing countries we encounter. And in Nepal, for the same kind of problems, uh, nuts and fruits in hilly areas project, we provide guarantee fund instead of credit line. So we try to um, see how and effectively uh, work. These options can work in different country settings and requirements. Uh, the second example I'm bringing up is the clean plant programs in India. It was approved by board, our board last December. We will, we are targeting to sign the project within this year. And the reason I bring, uh, introduce this despite it, it is not yet signed is it, um, this really required a lot of innovative thinking. And it's a very new ADB's operation project with the central government. So what this project is about is ultimately this is about uh, making the disease-free certified planting materials become available in the market in India and horticulture planting materials. For that, it starts with uh, testing and because the viruses are not seen by human eyes, it only can be confirmed by testing. So and then uh, prepare the mother blocks and making sure that there is a registered foundation and all the nurseries under certification program can get use this planting materials from the registered centers and they can multiply and eventually farmers have this option. So how this is um, supports greener uh, value chain. Because by using the disease-free materials, yield can be increased at least to 20%, or at some at times we also see 70% of yield increase. So natural resource management can be improved, and um, by reducing the application of um, uh, pesticides in the later end by uh, not addressing the widespread disease, it can also support the um, more eco better ecosystem management and greening of the value chains. Uh, and lastly, in terms of the private sector's uh, investment, these private nurseries required a lot of investment for greenhouse uh, facilities enhancement and um, other irrigation services for their uh, nurseries. So those are also, we are doing the matching grants with the private nurseries. Last example is about the uh, Mongolia project. So ADB's uh, operation in Mongolia is a really a showcase for the effective sovereign and non-sovereign linkage. Uh, this is my last case and I can conclude my presentation. So this financing provided in three batches. So over uh, as original project and additional financing from 2009 until 2021, phase two was approved in the end of 2023 and expected to start implementation this year. The core problem was the weak capacity to process and market uh, raw materials from the livestock and agriculture sector. For example, the Kashmir companies in a neighboring country was stronger than Mongolian Kashmir companies when the project started and the government sought ADB's uh, support to the industry. ADB provided uh, solutions to this in three ways. One is the commercial loans to Kashmir and other agribusiness companies. 
to match with the available lending in its foreign competitors uh, and provide business advisories for key operational areas and capacity building for herders and farmers. As a result, that we observed that 57 agribusinesses received lending support from the project and over 4,000 herders and farmers improved their capacity. And this is the uh, our very proud case and proud partner with uh, Gobi, the largest manufacturer in Mongolia. And uh, the project provided 30 million support and uh, as a liquidity support for low cashmere procurement. And we also um, I think the private and pub private sector investment can be wisely used to enhance the women farmers' uh, participation, as we have seen not only in this case, but in other areas of uh, operation. So I hope this provides some background for uh, discussions by panelists. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Snaev. Thank you. All right, uh, Sunae showed uh, basically value chain uh, concept and uh, different areas where uh, public and private sector uh, works and uh, showed some uh, EBRD project example and uh, uh, also ADB examples in Uzbekistan and uh, India and Mongolia. Um, I just want to uh, start requesting, uh, questioning uh, very generic questions to uh, every, pa uh, e every panel uh, member. First question I want to ask is, what are key public sector's role conducive to private sector investment in agriculture value chain development? And for instance, uh, Mr. Tari, uh, he's working on uh, PPP project. So how can public-private partnerships support agriculture value chain development? So uh, may I start with maybe Mr. Ray? Then I go to next. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, in my years of uh, experience with the government, being a city builder, I was part of uh, converting former military bases for almost two decades. And the success of PPP projects comes with, I think these are the pillars that we need to have in the government. First is to have a clear vision. With a clear vision, there must, next is to have a roadmap. A roadmap where there's a clear, eventually a clear master plan. A master plan for what that vision is. So for example, in the basis, we have master planned all these former US military bases in the Metro Manila camps. The Bonifacio Global City used to be the Fort Bonifacio, and now it's a premier central business district. The Clark uh, US Air Base is now Clark Freeport and Special Economic Zone. And that's where we come in. You know, what we, we're, the Clark International Airport is managing 2,367 hectares, an aviation complex. Now, the airport is only one-third of that space. And so what are we going to do with uh, the other, the rest of the area? So what we did, we, and fortunately for us in BCDA and the Clark International Airport Corporation, we have a clear master plan. And in that master plan, you know what kind of businesses that you can do. And what's good about the master plan is that you always tend to evolve that with the changing times. And that's probably where your questions come in. What an airport corporation is doing with a food hub, right? And because of the challenges of uh, the Philippine aviation industry and the competitiveness that we have with the rehabilitation of the NAIA with an incoming airport in Bulacan. 
how do we transform the Clark Civil Aviation Complex to be very competitive and to be aligned with the developments in everywhere in the country? So what, we're, what we did is to convert, you know, focus the airport into a more freight-based airport. That's why the battle cry of uh, the Clark International Airport Corporation now is to make that as a global civil aviation logistics hub of Southeast Asia. Now, when it comes to uh, the, uh, after a master plan, then we must have a clear guidelines. Guidelines when it comes to PPPs. And that's where I guess I believe that our government is doing right. We've just uh, released the uh, IRR for the PPP Act. And I know that ADB was a big portion of that. So when you have those major three pillars when it comes to you know, ensuring that there are available developments, there are available opportunities for, for the private sector, it's, go it's going to be clear for private entities to see what are available developments out there. They could plan out from the very beginning. So I guess uh, that's what I can share in so far as what we want to do. And uh, that's how the government can actually implement more projects. We've uh, outlined seven flagship projects. And the seven flagship projects came from just not, just not nowhere. It came from a master plan and a master plan that has evolved with the needs of the country, with the uh, priority projects of the, of the current administration. And the top priority uh, uh, project of this administration is about food sustainability and security. Thank you very much. Uh, have you heard of this uh, Fort Bonifacio Global City? Uh, have you visited uh, that city? I moved to the Philippines uh, 15 years ago, and that uh, city was uh, only starting, but uh, that was uh, military, I mean, huge land area. But that's probably one of the most developed and uh, uh, most fascinating city in probably Asia now. So if you have a chance, uh, please have a visit uh, this Fort Bonifacio Global City. It's uh, only seven kilometers from here. And uh, it has everything. I mean, you can live, you can shop, you can dine. Uh, it's excellent area. So I understand clear vision, master plan, communicating with the private sector for opportunities. These are all very important. Uh, thank you very much for sharing experience there. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Patel, please? Thank you, uh, my fellow panelists, uh, Professor Asok Gulati and the delegates from the different countries. Uh, since I am presenting uh, Government of India's premier think tank, Niti Ayo, so for the benefit of the delegates, I would take a few seconds that the India's agriculture, that journey, that is something very impressive. After 1947, post-dependence, you can see that time we were the food deficit country. So our whole of our energy and efforts to uh, transform the food deficit to food surplus country. And that we have achieved. And uh, you know in 2013, uh, to ensure the food security, government of India brought a legislation law to ensure the food security of the citizens of the India in 2013. And, uh, India is having one of the largest network of the researchers or research program. So here our, our approach is to work in the different sectors simultaneously. We have not waited that one will complete, then second will go. And here you also can see that uh, our private people are here. Professor Asok Gulati, a researcher and an academic scientist, he is here. From government side, we are here. So similar approach have been in India in the, all the sectors. So in 2021, considering that India is having 85, more than 85 percent farmers from small and marginal category. So, and they have been contributing in the production system, but how we can enhance their capacity, 
capability and also some economic finances, economic benefits also to these small and marginal farmers. Then one new ministry was created, Ministry of Cooperation. And if you find that Ministry of Cooperation was working when we are having self-help group of the women and the farmers producers organization concept was introduced. So in first page, we planned that we will uh, made 10,000 farmers producers organizations. These farmer producers organization are nothing like the collective group of the farmers, where we are the private people and the government fundings come to establish the infrastructure. Because in the value chain, it is impossible to create infrastructure for each and every uh, uh, individual farmers. So this concept uh, was introduced in India. And we are having 63,000 primary agriculture cooperative societies. So we use that our digital infrastructure to computerize them because we would like to enhance the capacity of these societies also to involve in the value chain. And after this, uh, if you see our approaches in the uh, one we are working than sustainability that they were in the beginning green revolution. So we would like to make it ever green revolution. That is sustainability. So sustainability starts from the maintaining the soil health, and then we introduce the soil health scheme, and then water, so rejuvenation of the ancient water bodies, micro irrigation, and Professor Gulati already covered several of our initiatives yesterday in his lecture. So I would not like to repeat that. And one of new thing that India is doing that is chemical free agriculture. Organic farming, we are number one in the world, and the natural farming. Means our one health concept, linking of the livestock with the agriculture. So that this is win-win situation for everybody. And the success of milk can be translated in the agriculture also if we can link this livestock with the agriculture. Now this if the, we have to develop the value chain. Then for chemical based conventional agriculture, we should have one value chain. And for this chemical free agriculture, we should have other value chain. So in now the farmers are coming that we need extra space in the marketplace. Similarly, for the certification and other things, also we need infrastructure. We are doing, but I'm, I'm telling you that there is enormous opportunities available for the private funding, for the participation, even for the financial institution also to work in this sector. And in India, this our median age of the population is 23 years. So this is our one of the strength. So to utilize this young population, we have changed in our course curriculum also, national education policy. And then we brought Atal Innovation Mission. So if some young is having some innovation, uh, innovation, some innovative idea in his mind, so government of India is through various program in private people also contributing so that the innovators can try their innovations. And uh, for this, uh, Ms. Kim has pointed out that UP success story, different levels, uh, channels. So here our aim is to cut these, to make this uh, channel short and efficient. How we can make it? There are several initiatives from the government of India side. And this, all the initiatives, not only the, this uh, government side. This is also from the private side. You can see the number of institutions which are now in India, private institution, their research agenda. So they are the partner and very much, I think most of the UN agencies now are the partner in India in our various programs. So in, we are very much open, as uh, Kim pointed out, the policy breakthrough. So we are very much more open if we find that in any time point of time, we need some policy changes, some frame change in the framework, some regulations. So you know that the, um, the one of the initiatives since the beginning to reduce the compliance burden. The people, those who are interested, they can see the website, there the, how many regulations we have removed, the compliance burden. So that this system can be the efficient one. And this process is going on still. And then one more thing, uh, in India, since the mostly women are involved in the agriculture and agriculture uh, allied sectors. So the, now people are take, uh, talking about the women development. In India, now our aim is women-led development. 
means not we make an empowerment, but women-led development. We would like to involve these women at the primary processing, the processing at the farm again. So therefore, these are our the continuous process where the multi-stakeholder are engaged, and uh, in, uh, in uh, my opinion, in my countryside, that now we have to put our emphasis as a, uh, this, uh, on the value chain from the Indian point of view. Because we, we are very good in production, we are number one and number two, but we are lagging in processing and value addition. So this is one of the sectors, sir, where this India is one of the country where our, uh, uh, we are giving the prime importance and where all people can be involved in the development of the value addition processing branding because you would like to work more on our, to, would like to export the things to uh, ensure the food safety and security of the, our neighbor's country and other countries also. With this, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patel. Yeah, uh, can see lots of uh, innovative activities, uh, uh, support provided by the government of India to these small and marginal farmers. And uh, it's, I mean, nice to hear this uh, kind of circular uh, agriculture system, regenerative, connecting livestock and agriculture. Thank you very much. Uh, may I invite uh, from private sector, uh, Ms. Hulang Dashtabar, uh, connecting online, please. Thank you very much for having me. I hope you hear me well. I am representing a private company in Mongolia, and uh, uh, the subject of uh, today's, today's panel is uh, value chain, value adding in food and agricultural sector. I think for Mongolia, this subject is very vital because um, Almost 90% of Mongolian exports is uh, products of the mining sector. So as the country and the economy, in order to be sustainable, we need to diversify. And Mongolia has huge potential in agriculture because we have vast um, territory and a lot of uh, animals. We, as you may know, we have more than 60 million um, cattle, but only 3.5 million people. So. Uh, Exports of agricultural products uh, now uh, only 5.4% of total all exports. So we really need to diversify and create value chain. So our company is uh, started uh, with trading and uh, also production, but now we are very much focusing on agriculture, especially in Kashmir. You may know that Mongolia is producing um, roughly 45% of the world raw cashmere. But unfortunately, which is 12,000 tons, but unfortunately, only 15 to 20% of raw cashmere is processed within the country. So as it was mentioned in the presentation of uh, Sunny, uh, government of Mongolia has embarked on this uh, program of uh, making final products. And thank you very much ADB for supporting this initiative. What is wanted from the government, in my opinion, is the long-term strategy and consistency. So we have uh, had a program that uh, raw cashmere would not be exported in a raw form, 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 but unfortunately from a few years ago, from I think, if I'm not mistaken, from last year, uh, the government has decided to allow exporting raw cashmere, which was, in my opinion, a step back from what has been decided to do, which is the value adding within the country. But uh, we are dedicated to uh, exporting final product, and we have a slogan uh, from goat to coat. So we are not exporting any even uh, semi-processed uh, product, which is uh, raw, uh, washed cashmere, or uh, even we are not exporting and uh, selling uh, yarns, we are only concentrated on the final product. So this is uh, what I would like to have request from the um, governments is to have consistency in the policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I can really appreciate uh, your words, uh, being working in Mongolia for actually uh, nine years, and I was in the sector. So I think this 
police is really important. Uh, the policy, I mean, I'm not talking uh, this specific policy, but whatever policy uh, which can help to nurture value addition within the country because that uh, generate opportunities for employment. I think that's really important. Thank you. Uh, may I invite uh, Mr. Pusun, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, in this hall, everybody knows that there is a, a requirement of uh, public uh, uh, policies or public sector uh, you know, support uh, to, uh, uh, to the private sector to grow. Uh, but of late, uh, I think in last 10 years, uh, maybe in one decade, we are uh, rather more emphasizing on the role of the public, private sector. Uh, we are expecting that the private sector will come up with many of their innovations and uh, uh, the current uh, you know, public sector policies will, will be uh, beneficial to them. But for agri-food sector, I think since last uh, two days we are discussing that it's not a, uh, not a uh, no kind of a easy way to go. There are many commodities, there are many types of value chains, there are many actors involved in the uh, commodities. Some of the commodities may, might have very few actors, some might have many actors. So the blanket kind of a policy are not going to work. So what we need, I fully agree what Mr. Perez said, that the clarity, what is the clarity? Dr. Patel was telling that uh, government has a clarity. The moment government will come up with a clarity on the focus on their you know, policy support to the private sector, private sector is definitely going to grow. But the question is, what are those policies? Are the policies will help risk sharing with the private sector? Because private sector are investing, so they have a huge amount of risk. Who will share the risk? The second thing, what we, we think about the regulations. Now, most of the uh, countries, they do have the regulations, which are mostly towards the you know, uh, betterment of the people, betterment of agriculture. But do we have regulations which are basically supporting the private sector to come in with, uh, with uh, maybe only with the idea. Which are the banks? Even I, I represent the supply side. I have never seen in my 92 member banks that they finance the ideas. So what is that? What kind of a support public sector can come up? The third one, which is the, the transparency. Public sector, till 10 years before, we used to mean no transparency. But of late, yes, transparency there. But whether this, this transparency will help the member institutions, like the banks, to manage their assets and liability. So these are the major issues I would like to flag here to be supported by the public sector policies so that the banks in one part of the value chain as a support and actors in the value chain both can be benefited. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep, it's great. Yep, three points noted. Uh, may I ask uh, Ms. Stephanie, please? Thank you, Takeshi. Well, I think a lot has been said already, but I guess when we think of uh, PPP, we have public and private coming together in a partnership. I would say, what about for the future? We look more to a structure like we have at Plant and Food Research. Uh, we are emerging a hybrid, if you like, uh, of the two. So we're a Crown Research Institute. We have one third of our revenue sourced from government funds directly. 
The second third of our revenue for operations is through commercial revenue, which is more from, say, your MFAT, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade for Development Projects, uh, like we often are managing across Asia and Africa. Um, and commercial contracts direct with commercial companies in New Zealand that seek our science and our resources. And then the final third is from royalties from our breeding programs, primarily based around kiwi fruit, pip fruit and berries. So therefore that gives us a resilience to operate in an operating system where we've talked so much over the past two days about climate shocks and there's economic shocks and there's government cuts. And with the structure we have, it gives us more resilience, uh, I feel, to operate in this space and continue in a really forward motion um, to absorb some of those uh, shocks and have the resilience to continue to operate and the space to innovate and the science. We have the science to do it with over 600 scientists based primarily in New Zealand, except me, who's in Cambodia. Uh, so from that, I guess it gives us an edge of that private sector hunger but our research and our drive, we have the ability to do research for impact. So therefore, I would say, what about some more mergings um, within the model? I think a lot has been said already, but just to add to Prasun saying about clarity, um, I would say public sector function is really important with communications. Uh, we are a market, we're a value chain, and you're only as strong as the weakest link in your chain. And I think communication is often a struggle and, and a weakness within these value chains. So um, government and public could function a lot more towards that approachability. Sometimes there's an inhibition to approach within different actors in the chain. If we have more communication throughout the chain, um, public sector could really bridge some of those gaps and we see a more stable, strengthened value chain and give the private sector the confidence to increase their investment in the chains. Thank you, Takeshi. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, emphasizing importance of the communication between public and private sector. Uh, may I ask uh, Dr. Kevin? Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Takashi. And the look at the role of public sector and private sector is always a fine line. It's very difficult to say. It's really very much depends on the stage of the value chain development where, where you are. And uh, you depends on the various degree of uh, private and public uh, partnership in uh, developing. And I used to lead a project supported by the Canadian International uh, Aid Agency, uh, CEDA. That time, I'm actually involved with the development of uh, agricultural value chain in one of the very poor county in China, in the Mongolia. That county is special because it's called the potato county. Why it's called the potato county? I only recognize the nature of the potato there when I actually landed there. And uh, you go there for breakfast, you got a potato. You go there for lunch, you got a potato. You go there for dinner, again, you got a potato. So there were a lot of potatoes. So that's offers a good foundation to develop something, the cluster, potato cluster. So that time, that year was 2005. So we are anticipating three years. Beijing is organizing Olympic Games. So the organization committee, one of the member from the Food and Drug Administration of China at that time served on my board for the project. So he said, he said, you know what, Kevin, we probably can look at a possibility to develop that potato from Wuchuan to supply that to Beijing, to supply to the, for the athletes, but you have to have good quality. So that's where that started, so for three years. And we started that platform, what I call the multi-stakeholder platform, really is the PPP partnership. So you have to have those different stakeholders together to develop a specific potato value chain from a very poor county, remote area. You have to make things work. And to address the poverty issue, that means you have to keep in mind the livelihood of the farmers in that particular county. 
So what do you need to do to make that happen? As I said, you already you need uh, Olympic game there to make a price premium for your potato. Later on, that time, supermarket revolution is uh, key. So we keep the supermarket as one of the huge stakeholders, right? And in order to supply to Olympics and to supply to the supermarket, you have to make a lot of things happen. You have to have branding, you have to have certification, and you have to have good agriculture extension, make sure, because potato is easily to get a disease, right? You have to make sure you control disease, so you have to have a good agriculture extension service. The government has to uh, offer that. And uh, Wuchang is quite far from Beijing. So how can it address the transportation issue, right? And you can talk all you want. If transportation getting too long, too expensive, you're not going to make any money, right? Your value chain is going to be failed. So that's become a huge. So who should invest on roads? Of course, government, right? So in China, we always have a saying, if you want to get rich, build your road first. That's the slogan of the government at that time, right? Of course, nowadays we're talking about build the internet highway, right? That's become important. So that means at that time, all those things has to be happen at the same time. And you have to have good marketing company to support you. How can you sell your potato from Wuchuan to the supermarket in Beijing, right? Supermarket are not just going to open the door for you, right? You need someone work for you, right? So the contracting with the supermarket become important. When you talk with the smallholder farmers, how they sign a contract with the supermarket, they are in very disadvantaged position, right? The term that a supermarket has is very high, right? It's almost exclusive of smallholders. So what should you do? Government in the way has to come in to address the issue from the public goods side, right? Look at what kind of benefit you can use that to address the poverty. Then supermarket need to do something for the good of uh, benefit of the smallholders. So all those things, they are public policy, things you can do, and things the private sector need to do, all mixed together. But who should do what and uh, to me, it always depends on the stage of that value chain development. And you, in the beginning, you will need more public support. But later on, you want to make sure the public sector get out. If, if they don't get out on time, you're going to screw up that particular value chains. So that's all becomes. So to me, that's no such clean line on the so-called PPPs. This is a fine line. The fine line is changing according to the development of that particular value chains. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate your knowledge and uh, wisdom. Thank you. Um, I think uh, there are a number of questions I wanted to ask, but uh, uh, time is uh, short. So I just want to uh, ask uh, a few panelists, uh, in terms of financing, um, how we can promote uh, agriculture value chain, I mean development, uh, to be more green and more climate oriented uh, through, you know, green financial pro financing products or climate oriented finan uh, financing products. What is the role in public sector and private sector? I just want to ask uh, uh, Mr. Prasun about this question for you to answer. Yeah, no, thank you very much. This is uh, <coughs> very important that uh, I divide this question into two parts. First, uh, uh, about the, what are the, 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 uh, the role of public and commercial uh, you know, financing support. See, what, uh, what is actually required at, the, at a you know, uh, value chain development level? Whether you include farmer in the value chain or you exclude the farmer in the value chain. Based on the, uh, the statistics of this region, if we remove the farmer from the value chain, that will be a disaster. So if we include farmer in the value chain, that is a 
disaster to the banks and the financial institutions. So, so both way, we are in a really in the crossroad where we want to include farmers because they are the most important stakeholder. But when we include farmers, it becomes very difficult and a burden to the financial institution based on the historical data in the banks because most of the non-performing assets are coming from agriculture, especially the farming sector. So what is required in these positions? Like you have to uh, offer services to both. So under this, what we, we, we think as a bankers association in this region that we need to have a provision for access not only the credit because uh, most of the government want that the banks should provide credit some uh, some uh, com uh, some country 25% some country 18% some country 10% so that is a requirement for the banks to do go for agriculture but what about the access to market? Whether government or the central bankers are coming up with a condition that whether your farmers is, has a access to the market. The model currently being used in India, which is the farmer producer organization, which is empowering the farmer to, uh, uh, to access the market higher market because the lot size when a farmer they have a less marketable surplus when a group of farmer you have high amount of marketable surplus so you are accessing to the market higher market becoming easy so that become one of the major facilitator to the uh, to uh, to value chain financing the other area I, so far I think is to go beyond that is research and development. And this is not a banker's job. Bankers are not in the R&D. Bankers take R&D from others to use in their day-to-day -day operation. So the R&D is not only on agricultural development. R&D is on how the market will work when a farmer is connected with the market, high-end market, local market, or a uh, no national level market. So that kind of R&D the bankers need. The bankers need R&D on ESG. They have learned about ESG, environment, social governance, how to monetize it. They have no idea how to monetize it. Because in banks, in the financial institution, they think everything into monetary terms. So how to monetize that and put this into their risk criteria so that they can prepare their interest rates. You have to think from the banker's point of view that their interest rates are based on various factors. One of the factors which we are thinking about nowadays, we are talking about uh, ESG, but we don't know how to monitor is the ESG. The other thing I think the information. Most of the banks, I, I remember that we do have some services available from the industrial bodies. But what about the agriculture? What about the agricultural bodies providing information to the banks, which might be free, might not be free, doesn't matter. But the flow of information about agriculture, about the market of agriculture, about the future of agriculture need to be available at a click by the financial institutions. Then only it will be easy for them to, uh, to support the uh, value chain development process and uh, provide their kind of a you know, uh, instrument they would like to use for those uh, actors in the value chain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, now I want to ask uh, just a question about uh, ADB's roles uh, in terms of this value chain development or uh, 
making value chain more greener, um, water conserving, energy conserving, less food, I mean, few, uh, less food print, uh, how ADB can help uh, to, you know, uh, DMCs, developing member countries and uh, farmers, uh, you know, to develop value chain and make the value chain more green. Uh, I just want to ask each person to speak only two minutes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with uh, opportunity first. Opportunities and then how to extract them and then eventually what ADB will come into play with. Opportunity like Clark. Um, Kevin said about building roads for you to get rich, right? Then, our, um, Sone mentioned earlier about location, location, location. In Clark, our look, our, we are connected. We are connected, connected, connected. It's all about connection. We are very strategic in location, that's why that base was created. And you know the opportunities that we have is that we have such a huge space that is available for everyone to develop. And that mega food hub is one of the key major facilities that we need in the country in order to ensure food sustainability. Because what we envision in the Clark mega national food hub is for it to become a fresh food market with cold chain, with cold storage and cold chain processing, value added services, and support services. Now, this wouldn't have been possible if there are, there's no ADB that thought people like me on how to create opportunities. And that's where opportunities where you know People know how to create packages, projects that are good for PPPs. And there are a lot of these projects in the Philippines. But unfortunately, LGUs, corporations like SIAC don't have the capacity. They don't know the available financing options out there. They don't know how to use other people's money. Because PPP is all about that. And if ADB could do capacity building to many of these government institutions, corporations, local government units, they'll come up with better opportunities for everyone. And that's how you extract them. Now, talking about capacity building, everything that you want us to do, in terms of environmental sustainability, making sure that projects are greener, more sustainable, more environment friendly, you can input, you can include in many of these capacity buildings. You know, it's about teaching the people in the government because we have so many assets. When it comes to the food value chain, it's also about teaching this, uh, the, the, the producers, the livestock growers. It's capacity building, not just into, you know, growing, how to grow, how to grow farms, how to uh, how to do livestock, but also financial literacy, financial financial literacy, so that they are able to manage themselves, so that you don't have to worry about, you know, non-performing loans. For banks, it will become more bankable. If, for example, we teach them how to improve their credit score. There should be a way where we could, we, we could uh, incentivize farmers who are doing well by way of granting better packages or incentives when it comes to loans. So I think there's so many things that we need to do on that level. We could also in, uh, have capacity building for um, values orientation because it's about you know, being in the markets Everybody is very competitive. And in a way, with values orientation, you could uh, change the game by making things, uh, ensure that at least there's a fair game for everyone, from the farmers, the cooperatives, the federations, the traders, MSMEs. So I guess uh, that's where 
uh, I guess that ADB could change the, the way the, public, the PPPs are done specifically for the agribusiness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Patel, please. Yeah. Thank you. First, I am endorsing his views. What he has told, this is important. But in the point of view of the India, we have introduced one program, one district, one product. Uh, this is to for uh, vocal for local to promote the local product of the India. And since this our new program is coming, clean plant program that ADB is doing with India. So there you will be able to identify the clusters because where your planting material is going. So from the beginning, you, if you can identify the clusters, because tomorrow you may need the infrastructure for the processing, for the value addition, and for the also these uh, practices for growing those plants. So there, in the cluster-based approach, can be taken by the ADB. And the third thing, that you are already working in uh, UP to improve the value chain and market, that, uh, the market linkages. So that lessons uh, can be replicated in other parts of the, not only in India, other countries also. How these farmers collectives, farmers can be collected and their uh, value chain can be more efficient so that farmers should get the remunerative prices for their product. The second. And third is, I think my gender inclusion is very important in value addition. And generally most of the projects, is my experience, we are not involving the women farmers uh, in any of the country. So that gender inclusion is very important, not only in the production, but in the value chain. And this we have seen that if you see the success of International Year of Millets, which India proposed, first in 2018, we celebrated as the National Year of Millets, and then we proposed at the UN, and we got that Security Council. So last year, you can see the change in the women, those who are involved in the millet processing, millet production, and also the making the different type of dishes. So this type of the success can be replicated in the different countries as per the requirement of that nation to ensure the food security. And uh, uh, Dasji pointed out about this transportation. I think this is one of the sector in the value chain that there you have to reduce the time so that the quality produce can be reached from the farmer's field to the consumer. And in most of the countries, and in India also, this is one of the region that the wastage are there, wastage happening. So you, uh, ADB can think to design few projects and then on the basis of that experience, that they, those can be replicated. That is all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your validation of some of the <laughs> our project's direction. And we're going to work closely with you. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, Mr. Das, please. Yep. Yep. Thank you. <coughs> I think uh, hmm, ADV is uh, having you know, expertise, resources. So they can be involved in many of these uh, no, cross-cutting issues, as uh, pointed by Dr. Patel. Uh, some of the major issue I think is still missing in ADB project designing. One of them is definitely, I think, uh, Sane already talked about the instruments. When most of the ADB projects are looking at the instruments which are low-hanging fruits, let us not only try out the low-hanging fruits, let us also go a little bit higher up, where we talk about the enhancement instruments, credit enhancement instrument, for example, guarantees, uh, blended, blended finance, which are being used, but very often, I mean, not so uh, no regular uh, in ADB projects. Third one is the risk management instruments where you can manage the risk. For example, insurance, putting insurance as one part of the, uh, of the whole project. Probably there are. But the one which I am talking about, the future market. The future markets in agriculture value chain development will be the, the you know, latest area of development in the financial sector. So I think ADB can take a lead on this. And finally, uh, like a cross-sector review. 
what are the relations between agriculture trade market infrastructure this type of studies taken up by uh, adb can be you know made available to the financial sector so that the financial sector at any point of time are not confused with the with the relationship between uh, among these uh, you know entities thank you thank you very much uh, may i invite uh, ms hulan ms hulan are you okay uh, yeah, okay please. yes uh, i think the question was how adb can contribute to uh, providing greener uh, solutions uh, while providing financing i think you already have a certain um, uh, aspects of uh, this in the loans for instance uh, the loans we have received for our gobi kashmir has uh, this uh, uh, part that we need to provide training to herders so that they're not only focusing on quantities of uh, kashmir but also on the quality so that uh, uh, they are not having too many goats which are creating already creating environmental uh, problems in in the country so i would encourage that you keep this focus of providing financing together with special um, aspects and having requirements covenants to uh, meet and and also maybe could be a good idea to work with commercial banks in the countries by to training them how to provide to include these sustainability features and requirements in their in their loans and financing thank you very much thank you uh may i ask uh Stefan, yeah, Stephanie, please. So, being an agronomist, my background is in sustainable farming systems, no-till agriculture. Um, always trying to optimize that more crop per drop in Australian and Southeast farming, Southeast Asian farming systems mainly. So, for me, I think looking at those greener value chains is going to come back to the agronomy and the production side of things every time. It's the whole value chain, but that's where I'm always going to look to straight away and I think ADB can really assist and, and they do already but assist further in incentivizing farmers and allowing farmers accessibility to that next step already we are training them in integrated pest and disease management um, through our best management training packages and that capacity building that's been talked about we're seeing them in Cambodia particularly which I'll talk more about tomorrow double their incomes from implementing these sustainable farming systems um, practices however the next step is um, like at the moment in Cambodia there's a heat wave warning out it's 41 degrees across the country at the moment which as you know, when you've got the build up to the wet season, it's really 45 or 46 degrees. Now that is difficult to be a human in those temperatures, let alone a little fast growing vegetable that is trying to get to market um, without you know, transpiring to death. Uh, so we have in, instigated last year 10 rain out shelters, so protected croppings, uh, really for stability of production throughout the monsoon period, which is really destructive from the heavy rains, to get that stability within the value, value, value chain for vegetable production, getting more to market, therefore seeing more private investment and stability in the market, et cetera, and the farmers are, it's a win-win for everyone. But with these protected cropping structures that are a rain out shelter, they're open sided to allow airflow, but they protect against the rain. They funnel up the air out, the hot air out. The cooling plastic we're using is actually reducing the temperature we're finding under these uh, structures by two to four degrees. So therefore now we have another element of use for it throughout the whole season. If we can bring in irrigation and water use efficiency and have some supplementary irrigation, we can get cropping throughout perhaps the whole year or certainly extended windows of production which is going to benefit again everyone. So the problem is the farmers cannot access, they can't self-finance themselves in. We've been able to subsidise these structures to pilot it but the farmers really want to expand, they want to grow, they want to implement more. They're stuck. Land tenure and, and financing is so difficult for f access to finance for farmers and in Cambodia and other DMCs. So low interest loans, perhaps zero interest loans at some point with precise payback periods because they're making money quickly when they can get these structures in place. Um, and the scalability of it, I think ADB could really assist in that area. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Chen, please. I know uh, ADB wants to be, or probably already be, climate uh, bank. And uh, more than that, I think it should become really a knowledge bank. That's very uh, important. Uh, we still have millions and millions of smallholders in Asia and the Pacific. We want to include them in the modern value chain, and we want them to adopt uh, many sustainability or sustainable practices, right? And we are not short of a technology or business model for sustainability, but adoption is a big question. That's the issue. Then what should we do? And uh, if I look at my experience in China, I would say two things are very important. ADB need to take a much more closer look. One thing certainly is the power of consumer, right? We seldomly talk about what happened in the consumer side, how that helped the project implementation. But that's become such critical issue, and it's become branding and all those become very important. Second thing is really, when you're facing the smallholders, you have to find a way to aggregate them. So what is the best way? So you have to be innovative in organizations, right? For example, those days in China, the agricultural services sector is booming. It's really to provide a different type of service to smallholders, including the sustainable practices. How you do that, that's become important. Then, in terms of ADB, well, you give money or loan to the national or local commercial bank, right? So you have all those ideas, sustainable loan, and so on. But it's very difficult to implement at the local level. Why? If you look at the local banker, do they have a taxonomy for making investment in sustainable practice? No, they don't. Do they have their list? No, they don't. So that's why if you want them, the bank, local bank to adopt the, that standard, then ADB have to promote that in a real time, right? You have to invest on that. If you don't invest that, the idea, good idea, ADB staff has not going to translate into the action in the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, we want to uh, invite uh, some of the online uh, audience, uh, if maybe two questions, if you have. No. Okay. Is there any, anyone have questions? Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, on site. Yeah. Let's go on site, please. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Please. Thank you very much. My compliments to a very rich knowledge on the table on public-private partnership particularly. My question and a submission to ADB, uh, especially to my old good friend, Kevin. Potatoes, 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 and roads to riches. It's great to find a market, a good market, whether Olympic athletes or supermarkets for the smallholders and improve their income, no doubt about that. The title is Greener Agri Value Chain Development. I would add greener and nutritious agri value chains. Now, two questions. Are the value chains Green and potatoes basically are carbs, are they nutritious? And why I'm saying this, in India, what we experienced, we produce about 60 million tons of potatoes. And potatoes can be stored almost for a year. You must have visited Taj Mahal in India, if at all you come to. That Agra is also the city is a hub for potatoes where they store it for a year and supply it to down south 
2,000, 2,500 kilometers down throughout the year. All those cold storages, 90% of India's cold storages are for potatoes. And they are all being driven by thermal power. The cost of which is 10 rupees per kilowatt hour. And first time when I visited that whole hub, I said, my heavens, solar can produce at half, less than half the cost. Why all these cold storages are running on normal electricity being supplied through thermal? That's number one. And that's a proposal for ADB and NABARD. I understand you signed something yesterday. And this is one of the projects you should create a cluster entirely based on solar storage to supply potatoes all over India. That's number one. Number two, road to riches. I agree fully. But when you put the roads and permanent roads, solid roads, normally what I'm seeing in China and many other places are cemented roads. Cemented roads, cement is the most polluting. Cement and steel are the polluters of the world. How are you making them green? Are you creating roads where plastic waste is being used underneath to create much more durable roads? That is to make it greener, to supply all over. Last bit, we have to make potato somewhat more nutritious. How much of your potato is purple potato? More antioxidants. How much is the protein in that potato? Athletes will not live on carbs. Thank you. Do I have time? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the discussions. When agricultural economists, including Kevin Chen, uh, talk about high value transformation, we think of supermarket. Role of supermarket is hugely important. Supermarket provides improved seeds safe pesticides on credit, so farmers have to repay later. So credit issue is solved. And then also supermarket or agro, uh, sometimes agro processor as well, provide instruction about production practices. And then there are hundreds of studies, empirical studies, which have attempted to assess the impacts of contract farming on the income of farmers. I reviewed all of them. Roughly speaking, 50% of studies found no impact on farmers' income. 50% of studies found only small, small uh, impact. Why? The reason is very simple. Farmers passively accept inputs, passively accept uh, production instruction. How can they become rich? They must have ability to make own decisions. Therefore, if we really want to make farmers better off, we have to invest in human capital of farmers. So I strongly recommend the ADB to look at the impact of uh, uh, human capital investment. Similarly, agro processors, uh, including pack houses, pack houses are very important, which uh, wash, uh, dry, sanitize, and then package and then sell to a supermarket. Without pack houses, the uh, pharma, farms and supermarkets are not connected. And, but these agro-processors are not, not, not necessarily uh, efficient. That is the common understanding among development economists. Most scarce factor, most limiting factor of production in developing countries is managerial ability. Management is very poor in, in many uh, uh, enterprises, including agro-processors. So again, it is important to invest in human capital of agro-processors. Human capital is always impo more important than money. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oskar Sensei. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Please, yeah. Uh, would, would you introduce yourself to me? Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Takeshi Ueda. My name is Neil Ian Lumanlan. I'm from Manila. And I'm affiliated with the IBI, uh, International Biochar Initiative in New York, USA. 
and as well as climate reality project uh, uh, also uh, in USA. So I'm wearing my biochar hat right now. And um, yesterday, uh, we, we, we heard about uh, climate and carbon, um, you know, all that um, bandwagon on carbon investments. So, and then I heard uh, just a few minutes ago about Cambodia reaching 40 to 45. I've been to Chiang Mai where burning uh, mountains is just nine kilometers from my apartment um, every night. And talking about uh, air pollution across Asia. So we, we have heat waves and then we have a very polluted, uh, a very polluted continent because of the Asian smog. So it's coming from burning of stubble from rice fields and sugar cane and which is the base of bioplastics production in Thailand and Vietnam. Now, um, and then we heard about India having 60, oh, well, being the number one producer of milk more than the United States. So connecting all of this, uh, what value can we bring to the smallest, let's say, a uh, woman who has four cows in India? And then, um, I believe in the power of, of, let's say, how many billions of farmers in Asia. If all of them will be given the power, the knowledge, how to make biochar on their own, um, which can be fed to the cattle, a handful of biochar, just 0.2% per day in, in their feed, in the grass, uh, along with the right microorganisms. So the right type of biochar, say uh, from rice hus and rice hull or over sugar, sugar cane bagasse, what do the farmers get? They get immediate benefit, uh, 1.4 liters. This is uh, well studied and acknowledged by universities in the USA and in uh, research institutions in Asia. I know that India is also has so many biochar researchers. Um, so 1.4 liters additional milk per cow per day, that's about 60 to 80 rupees per day per cow, times four for the average household. So that's about 330 rupees per day times 365 days. You have about $1,476 per woman for, for India. So multiply that and then um, you have what? Uh, 60 million liters at least on average additional 60 to 80 million liters of fresh milk for India per day. So how many children can be fed with 60 to 80 million liters of milk per day additional just by feeding them uh, about a handful of biochar every day. And that can be sold as carbon credits. And the impact with regards to the bulching of methane from the cow's uh, rumen, it can be reduced from 9 to 18 percent. So in a year, that's about 18 kilograms of methane reduced just by that. So again, sold to the carbon market uh, uh, depends on who you're selling your carbon to, your carbon savings to. So um, the thing is, there's money to be made. It's the only way we can pull down carbon through agriculture permanently. It's now certified by a recent study a year ago in, in Germany. Uh, it's now classified as inertinite. It's like ancient carb. You can, it can stay at least a thousand years. So, yeah. So that's my... Uh, proposal or suggestion for, for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, sorry, last speaker. So would you please yeah, make it yeah. short, that question. I, this is the last one, please. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you can approach us individually and we can answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Regina Nukunjan. I'm from Papua New Guinea Department of Agriculture and Livestock. 
Um, it's been very interesting to sit and listen to the, uh, the speakers plus the uh, uh, Miss Kim for uh, the introductory uh, presentation. And um, for us in Papua New Guinea, uh, ADB has been a partner, especially in infrastructure development, uh, roads especially. So for agriculture, it would be the first if it, you know, and we hope that um, and we invite ADB to come over and probably help us and guide us into uh, maybe having a... Um, uh, develop our agriculture, especially in the horticulture and um, agri-food uh, value chain. Um, and um, s listening to all that, and I'm just thinking in my head on how uh, the PPP with uh, um, the bank and as a sort of catalyst to bring together the PPP and the public sector into working something that can then bring uh, that benefit to the farmers. And uh, as I stand here, I probably represent the rest of the Pacific because we had a minister yesterday from Palau who also represents you know, other ministers from the Pacific and whatever that he was saying yesterday, it resonates with the rest of the Pacific Island nations. And um, it's really, um, um, you know, listening to other experiences and other, uh, you know, speakers yesterday and today, it shows that, you know, for Asia, you will advance. And for the rest of the Pacific, we are yet to catch up. And now with, you know, climate and um, the climate change impact on us, and then we will be, like we put in a place where we're trying to uh, accommodate, we're now being, you know, to how to do it sustainable, greener. All of these, uh, you know, it's it's overwhelming uh, for us as government to try to tell our farmers who are struggling, and 